Hi, this is Bill Lavender with the New Orleans Poetry Festival, and um, very excited to be hosting this roundtable today with um, Kelly Crumley, Alicia Wright, and um, Emily Barton Altman. Um, they're going to be talking about sites of history, direction and space in poetry and poetics. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly. Thank you. And thank you everyone at NOLA for letting us do this because we were really excited to come last year um, and see you all and visit and hang out in New Orleans in person. So I really appreciate, we really appreciate the opportunity to come um, kind of <laughs> like virtually. And so thank you also for making it available to anybody to pop in and view. That's been really awesome. Um, so we're going to get started with Emily is going to go first and then Alicia and then me and then we'll open it up for discussion and conversation after that for the folks in the room or in the chat. So Emily Barton Altman is the author of two chat books Bathymetry from Present Tense Pamphlets and Alice Hangs Her Map from Dancing Girl Press. Recent poems are forthcoming or appear in Tagverk, La Vague, Bone Bouquet, Dreginald, and elsewhere. She is a recipient of a Poet and Writer's Amy Award and received her MFA from New York University. She is currently pursuing a PhD in English and Creative Writing at the University of Denver. Thanks, Kelly. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, I just want to echo Kelly's thanks to uh, the New Orleans Poetry Festival for having us. Um, it's really excited, exciting to finally get to make this happen. Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, the way uh, the site works in terms of a creative project that um, I'm work currently working on and I'm going to read a, a portion of it, but first I'm going to give it a kind of critical introduction. Um, and so for that, I am going to share my screen. Everyone see that okay? Great. So this project is tentatively titled Procedure. Um, so the Fluxus event score developed by George Brecht in the late 1950s takes a simple form, the instruction, and combines it with performance to call attention to how small ordinary actions might be transformed. Hannah Higgins describes the Fluxus event as, quote, everyday actions framed as minimalistic performances or occasionally as imaginary and impossible experiments with everyday situations, end quote. Flexus's emphasis on the mundane and the general allows for many approaches to both writing and realizing a Flexus event score. The site specificity of each performance means that each staging of the score will look different depending on who the performer is and where it is performed. Flexus performances require readers and artists to be attentive to the specificity of objects and movements and how they might change one's relationship to a space. As Higgins writes, quote, our bodies, far from limiting us in our encounter with the world, simultaneously give us access to what our senses perceive and link us to the whole universe of human perceptions. The ultimate goal of Fluxus lies precisely in this task, to form multiple pathways toward ontological knowledge and the expans expansion of the setting of human experience." End quote. By reframing both large and small actions as performance, the reader and performer of those actions is forced to consider them with intentionality, an intentionality that not only draws attention to everyday behaviors, but also provides space for alternate approaches of art making and everyday life to emerge. My manuscript procedure draws on this tradition of performing the mundane, exploring the intersections of poetry and performance. The text is constructed from a series of performance procedures that draw on mundane actions and routines to interrogate the performative aspects of dailiness and of everyday life. 
I define dailiness and the everyday as routinized actions that create or seek to create a stable relationship between subjectivity and a set of key categories that are constitutive of subjectivity, including memory, temporality, and language itself. The project is split into two phases. The first stage is performance procedures like the Flexus events, which are durational and site specific. The second phase re-engages with the performance procedures and the text they elicit after time has elapsed to introduce new interventions into the initial text and disrupt and reshape them. By incorporating different kinds of repetition over different time spans, the forms of the text shift and change, raising questions for the performer and ultimately a reader about temporality and memory and how they inform subjectivity. In setting up processes that depend on repetition, I draw on what Richard Schechner terms restored behaviors or behavior that is rehearsed and repeated, but nevertheless unique in each enactment. Schechner argues that all human life is based on restored behavior and that performance uses restored, restored behavior to call attention to how occasion and context make each performed behavior unique. He writes, quote, to treat any object, work, or product as performance, a painting, a novel, a shoe, or anything at all, means to investigate what the object does, how it interacts with other objects or beings, and how it relates to other objects or beings. Performances exist only as actions, interactions, and relationships." End quote. Procedure examines the way that performance allows for these actions, interactions, and relationships to be explored through repetition, repetition that nevertheless allows for difference to emerge. While each performance process is site-specific and durational, its emphasis on restored behavior provides space for what Schechner calls, with rich ambiguity, something else to emerge. Quote, because it is marked, framed, and separate, restored behavior can be worked on, stored, and recalled, played with, made into something else, transmitted, and transformed, end quote. Procedure takes up this potential for transformation by using repetition over time to record gaps and differences that emerge through failures of memory and language. This attention to complications of memory, temporality, and reperformance places my work in a tradition of autobiographical performance inaugurated by writers such as Adrian Kennedy and Sophie Call. Kennedy's autobiography, People Who Led to My Plays, is a written catalog of people, texts, and things encountered over the course of her life. The text's repeated sections and language creates a circular effect that eludes the narrative of progress that its linear timeline promises. In her continuous return to the same people and things that influenced her life, Kennedy resists the narrative progression of the autobiographical form. Instead, she draws on circularity to enact the way in which identities are constructed through performative repetition. In refusing linearity, people who led to my plays instead enacts a subjectivity that relies on repetitions and shifts in moments of time. It points to the way that the tellable emerges only as a smoothing erasure of the performative aspect of these moments. This performativity is further explored in her play, Jude and Jean in Concert, The Concert of Their Lives. The play, published and performed a few years after People Who Led to My Plays, uses verbatim language from people in its dialogue. Protagonists of the play, twins, speak and write anecdotes that appear from the point of view of Kennedy herself and people. The splitting of the self embodied by the twin protagonists can be read as a gesture toward the multiplicity inherent in performative identities, multiplicities that shift temporality, temporally. With these juxtaposed temporalities existing in the same space, Kennedy points to the way that understandings of the self are constituted differently at different moments of time. By using her own proliferating language about her life as the dialogue of twins, Kennedy calls attention to the way in which concepts of identity that inform the self are never singular. Like Kennedy, Sophie Call interrogates the proliferation of identity, directly staging and disrupting aspects of her life through performance, relying on repetition to reveal the way that identities shift. In true stories, Call pairs photographs with paragraph long micro stories. First published in 1994, Call releases a new edition every few years, which adds to the previous one. This gesture, adding to and republishing the same text rather 
then sequels or follow-ups resist a linear progressive account of the self and its insistence on repetition and accrual. It also functions as a gesture towards excess. Rather than publish the subsequent stories as separate text or project, Call's insistence on continuing to add to the original text exposes the constructed nature of the self by rep representing it as something that is never a complete entity. Instead, understandings of subjectivity are constantly shifting and changing. Through the repetition of republishing, Call's text also shows how constructions of identities rely on repetition over time. Repetitions that, in their similarities, construct subjectivity and, in their differences, reveal that constructiveness. Call often recycles language from this and other projects and her other texts and performances. One example is a performance piece she created out of the language of true stories staged in 2011 and 2013. In the performance titled Room 20, Call lay in bed in a hotel room surrounded by objects and texts excerpted from true stories. She invited, invited viewers to wander around the room and if they chose to lie next to her in bed and whisper their stories to her. In using the language from true stories in Room 20, Call stages the language in a way that also stages aspects of herself, using the space of the room as a gallery that invites viewers to move around and read her stories. However, by being present in the room as a listener, she also gestures to how these stage aspects of the self are never totalities. Call and the viewers continuously switch places, didactically inhabiting the roles of the storyteller and the audience in different moments of time. This dissolution of the boundary between performer and audience calls attention to the way that performative aspects of the self shift, opening space for changes to emerge. By lying in bed, Call is simultaneously referencing her own previous performances that take place in a bed and using a banal activity to disrupt and transgress concept of, concepts of privacy and dailiness. Building on Kennedy and Call's example, I asked through my re-engagement with my initial writings how temporality and excess reveal alternatives embedded in routines and repetitions. And for this following excerpt from my, uh, my manuscript follows these, this set of procedural instructions. Uh, one, sit in a room of my apartment and describe my sensory experiences with my eyes open. Write down any thoughts about the space that I have. Then two, close my eyes and describe my sensory experiences again. Write down any thoughts about the space that I have. Three, repeat each room of my apartment once a week on Fridays. So the following three excerpts are different weeks, but they're all focused on the living room of my apartment. 61220, living room. I don't know what bird is singing outside the window. Is it a morning dove? No, I can Google this. A morning dove has a lower, almost grittier coo. Morning doves remind me of mornings in Michigan, the dew on the front lawn, the birds on the power wire stretched down the street. Are there morning doves in Colorado? Yes, the Audubon Guide online says they live in Colorado in all seasons. Their loku is described as mournful, which is how they got their name. I'm in the living room. My desk here is in the corner behind the couch next to the bookcases. This is where I spend most of my time, reading, writing, preparing for class, this room has a couch, three armchairs, a coffee table, two desks, two desk chairs, three bookcases, five lamps. It has the largest windows, French doors, and the most light. The plants are arrayed at various heights directly in front of them with space for the dog who likes to nap in the light. The bird seems to have flown away. Now I hear construction on my block, the occasional car working its way down the narrow street. Since quarantine blocked off the road through the park, there seems to be more traffic on the side streets. I look to see what kind of construction, some kind of concrete mixing. I can't see the source of the sound, but that is the kind of truck in my direct line of view. I see my neighbor walking his dog down the path. I close my eyes. Aside from the construction out the window, I hear my husband puttering in the kitchen, unwrapping something plastic. The dog is asleep near the plants in the window, unfazed by the construction. No moth so far today. The miller moth migration period is ending and there are fewer in our apartment each day. 
I open my eyes and look for the tools on the radiator, a cup and an envelope for catching. Masks near the door next to the keys and the shoes. 6 19, 20, living room. A colder rainy day today, a break from the heat. Thunderstorms predicted for later. I didn't sleep last night and my head is buzzing. It's too late for more caffeine. I cracked the window so that fresher air will filter through the apartment. I'm sitting at my desk again, stacks of book higher this week than the last, piles of papers shifted around to make more room. It's garbage day, the truck lurches down the street outside my window, the brakes squealing when it stops at the neighboring building. Otherwise, the day persists quietly. Yesterday, my husband came back from the store with a new plant, small lavender plant, which is now on the plant table near the window. No moss for the past few days. I close my eyes. I can hear the dog drinking water from her bowl, can hear the occasional car drive past down the road. Tinnitus fills my head today. My dog ambles into the room and lays her arthritic bones down by the window. My husband walks in and sits at his desk to prep for a meeting. The low roar of the ocean that fills my head mingles with my headache. Not enough sleep, too much time staring at the screen or the weather. I should probably take some aspirin. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Alicia Wright. Alicia Wright is a PhD candidate in English and Literary Arts at the University of Denver, where she serves as the Denver Quarterly Editorial Fellow. The recipient of fellowships from the Iowa Writers' Workshop, her poems appear in Ecotone, The Paris Review, and West Branch, among others. Her critical prose appears on the Plowshares blog, The Los Angeles Review of Books, and is forthcoming with Full Stop. She is the editor of the newly launched Annulet, a journal of poetics. Thank you, Emily. I am so pleased to know what it's been like on Fridays <laughs> in text. Um, and I'm also just so happy to get to participate in the New Orleans Poetry Festival. And can everyone hear me okay? Awesome. Um, yeah, that's the link to Annulet. Uh, feel free to check it out. Thanks, Kelly. Um, and it's been really great getting the chance to listen in to the different readings and panels throughout the month of April, it's a lot of work. And I really, I really appreciated it being so like, you know, away from poetry, culture and community as I have been at times. So thanks to the New Orleans Poetry Festival. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll get started and I'm gonna screen share <clears throat> really quick. We'll see, oh my gosh. How about that? I need to do full screen. All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to do this little exploratory talk. I'm going to turn on my timer. Um, and it's sort of, it's okay. It's called Poetry Signposts, Site Markers, Cemeteries, and Trails as Trans Historical Forms. Um, so, so much is made of walking in poetry, walking as poetry, walking as a generative activity for poetry. And so much is likewise made of the landscape through which people move, tread over, hike through. We must portage our senses along, how our bodies, uh, according to how our bodies' respective mobilities are to experience the world and have thoughts and feelings and reaction to it. I am and have been less interested in each of these routes within poetics from the reflexive identification of the poet as sight, uh, Wordsworth, the lonely cloud, as I have been in what is accumulated through time, <clears throat> either etched in a physical place or in historical memory attached to place. And more to the point, I'm interested in how to attend to and think through that accumulation, especially if it is otherwise invisible. I'm interested uh, and how poems function as commemorative aggregations that evoke feeling and or event and feeling, borrowing the theoretical framework of the elegiac mode, but positioning that very structure as static, tethered, encounterable to a particular latitude, longitude, perimeter, condensed even into a sign, sight marker, marker. How do poems, ones that both engage and sidestep the open field and its noonday sun of projective verse, 
function as signposts and guide us through their signals. I'm gonna talk a little bit about work from a few contemporary to recent poets, Susan Tishy, Roy Fisher, Heidi Lynn Staples, and Metasama to consider as and to draw lines between the relationships, uh, relationships, lyric and semantic and social that comprise the sites depicted in their work and link their work according, uh, accordingly as a new productive line, not tied to or based in rhyme and meter as transhistorical uh, in the title of my talk might suggest within literary history, but as something moving laterally, perhaps unpredictable, slower and faster, both resituating poems as part of their material circumstances of place and the figures that they take, reference and make. I could have spent this whole talk probably just on Susan Tishy's The Avalanche Path in Summer, uh, which traces pathways, pain, history, experience, handwriting, mountaineering, and citations from figures such as John Ruskin and Robert McFarlane into a latter day reinvigorated postmodern romantic mode. Brian Tears on plein air poetics transposed. The Avalanche Path, let me find it. Uh, <laughs> is a line on a geologic scale. It is a fall of snow flattening trees down a slope and remains visible on the mountainside for years afterward. And this is a picture from Susan Tishy's actual blog um, with that caption at the bottom, um, which I think that's her, that's her work. Um, <clears throat> let me see. So too, okay. And remains visible on the mountainside for years afterwards. So too is the collection tangentially as we are all, um, sorry, memories of, as we have, oh, okay. Uh, for years afterwards, it's like, yeah. Uh, so too present in the text um, are the memories of traumatic events about a literal fall, uh, quote, where he fell and the hiking speaker's frequent, frequent slips and falls. One longer poem called Ghost is comprised of two stanzas per page set diagonally from each other, both iterations of thought and footsteps marking it. Tishy is hiking through Scree, a poet stream, perhaps the word literally, but it's also literally precarious, those busted up fragments of rock marking traces of event. Rocks come to, come to rest at the end of motion, a pause in their history, picking her way through. Let me show you the Scree. <laughs> um, can't do that. Uh, picking her way through, Tishy notes, quote, a noise half brook, half silence in the scree, brachiopods in the limestone pace of thought from steep to steep, thought itself traveling now over the course, <clears throat> etching in language. Uh, she goes on backwards as forwards, long slopes of debris. <clears throat> Rest your hand on a book so to hold the pen long. And in this concentration, errors appear as missteps, not summer snow, but summit snow, not summit snow, but summit. It's a verb, trail worn into the white, white rock. Thought is script conjunct to footsteps. Tishy reads her surround, her body and thoughts uh, in and as part of a wilderness context far away from social histories, except that which are carried in the physical body and its mind. The relationship between the avalanche path in summer and Susan Tishy's previous collection, Traffic, from 2015, might not be so obvious as for, at first. <clears throat> the latter, uh, a hybrid historical speculative investigation into her Scottish family's genealogy and the early arrival of one of her ancestors as the settler colonist become a slave owner in what is now present day Maryland, uses archival information like Susan Howe, but with a clear prose bolstered ethical narrative to light the past up like a lamp in order to see it more fully, circumstances of individual feeling, questions of ownership and moral failure wrought into the foundation of the US state. It is necessarily imperfect site. In order to comprehend such a historical record, Tishy uses family lore as a speculative site for the evaluation of how events came to be in the past. Who for six generations did what they did, blood and rain, dirty handful of raw oats, she quote. Such involutions of legend into poetry lead Tishy in the end to a cemetery. Alexander, the ancestor, the grain stones vibrate in traffic noise. This is quoting. I leaned against them and struggled to hold oblivion, rock and blood on the verge of partition, 
land voice without responsory. What is left of the oak trees layered? And I, relic of the voyaging, refraction at a point of displacement, placed there in deciduous certainty. Something appears, a many, oak branches move but silently, the road quantifying. I leaned, Alexander, I did not embrace. <clears throat> Stones outside the fence were not contracted to aftermost light and the sanctuary. Survival by pleasing, I did not say on which stone, grave, ruin, foundation, fence, consult in order to disregard. Such a conflict between markers of a site, the inevitable destination, with perhaps the most resounding signification, a graveyard, results in a space whose ethical indeterminacy exceeds the circumstance of Tishy's initial inquiry. There is only the speaker in the end talking to the site rather than perhaps of it. Quote, I am reading this poem to a dead oak. It turns out there must be two to receive the spirit, one to speak and the one to understand. For Roy Fisher, there is someone there to understand down in the pit with him. <clears throat> a, speakership, a speakership that shifts between workers in the minds and the history's sonorous first per and history sonorous first person, plural. In his great 1986 book link sequence, A Furnace, Fisher traces the consequences of social history compounded through industrialization in the coal country of the English Midlands and arrives at the terrifying interior core, the site of compression out of which coal and self are made and has this to say about the site. For core, dead acoustic, dead space, chamber with no echo sits at the core, its place plotted by every force within a dead fall. Grave goods that have motion have it on their own account, respond to nothing. The chamber whose location knots an entire symmetry uses none. Heterogeneous, disposed without rhythm, climax, idiom, or generic law, grave goods send word back out. Continuing, that sky trails may merge with earth trails. There's supposed to be a hyphen in sky trails. The material spirits, moving in rock as an air. It's down by just a step or two into the earth, mounted above at the sky, and the floor obliquely, tilting a little to the upper world again. We're carving the double spiral into the stone. Don't complicate or deflect us. We know what we're at. We're letting the sun perceive, and we've got the hang of it. And that section continues. Um, so I'm going to move forward. Write sky laws into the rocks, draw that, sorry, that's also Roy in a field. <laughs> and that's apparently uh, the cover of his forthcoming collected too. Uh, write sky, this is from the same section. Write sky laws into the rocks, draw the laws of light into it and through it. On the door, under the ground, have them face inwards into what might otherwise seem dark. Fisher is writing um, from within contamination, from the route down sinking the personal and the specific site of mine uh, made collective and back out again. And it serves as a model for writing from within industrial sites and their individual and historical residences, both urban and rural to the somewhat occult. This is also what Heidi Lynn Staples points to in her 2018 collection, A, I don't really know how to say it, but it's AAAA. -A -A -A. Additionally, um, R.I.P. Asata, who both who put out both Heidi Lynn Staples and um, the Avalanche Path in Summer, um, and the and Staples' work takes as its premise the experience of living amidst many different official markers um, in an industrially contaminated world localized in the state of Alabama. The the collection's title um, A with asterisks in it. Um, enacts the settler colonial tension of the fact that the state name wherein the poems mostly take place, Alabama, plays on one of the tribal names of the original inhabitants, the Obamaha. From, the site, from sites along the Trail of Tears to landfills, to sites for birding excursions, forts, piers, state parks, the poems and the ethical concern of AAAA revolve around such different sites of toxicity, whether through chemical spill, constant litter, or the toxic affect of human inhabitants, and the problems inherent to tourism, the more regular term for a poet going places to respond to things. 
Throughout, unusual symbols percolate the palms, disrupting syllables and scents, a pathogenic insistence <clears throat> that clogs and contaminates quote unquote ordinary lyric work. Staples in a long poem titled Blackbird Yawns in the Hazardous Waste. Um, I'll explain this. <laughs> Locates the palm at Kim Waste, ML, Alabama, the largest hazardous waste site in the US, um, and confesses. Uh, I know that my silence is involved in the hazardous waste. While at the site, she further implicates her own and the reader's limitations of sight um, in terms of the sense and sight in terms of place. It was as far as you can see, it was a containment and it was a an attempt to contain. The hazardous waste lies on Selma chalk. Um, and so, this is the slide is from a study and I'm interested in it in part because of the question mark of the illegible symbols, um, which also mirror the weird uh, symbols that also percolate Staples' own poems. Um, yeah. Staples' project for this collection of poems was to learn how to live in that particular historical space. And through her travel across her new home state, the poems function as an account of acquiring historical knowledge, a somatic experience of specific sites historical, pre historical present. Another poem featuring uh, this, the blackbird, which is sort of her figure for a relationship to traditional poetry, like Stevens's blackbird. Um, blackbird figures in a late getaway, enumerates a somatic experience and consequences of going to the site. Um, by way of a graveside marker, the tensions of a blank slate, or what is supposed to be written, what should be, and what may be absent from historical records, but is articulated in sites of such contemporary convergences, which is cemetery in close proximity to a toxic waste site in Alabama. Um, the poem has 13 parts, like the blackbird, emphasizing ways of looking, calling back to a sense of outsiderness and literary, tr literary tradition. In its final section, Staples makes plain the situation of the lake in the nearby Pruitt Hill Slave Cemetery, both recounting the group's actions and overheard conversation. We've come here to figure, solving nothing. Let's see. Uh, dissolving for X. Daniel trips in the hole. Katie sits on the lake's edge. Meredith sits on the lake's edge. Spencer stands on the periphery. Brett paces the periphery. Carter bends down. Jordan steps over and Jordan steps. It was seven white graduate students and their white professor driving into this neck of the woods like when they came in here with sonar equipment to see what's down there past the blank slates. The waters have been rising. The lake getaway may be eroding. It was yesterday and enslaved dressed in all white driven down the middle of Tuscaloosa to work in Mobile today. It was a gate and a welcome. The late getaway lies at the end of Old Byler Road, oldest public road in Alabama. Such a circuitry between sites and working within and among them represents an ongoing attempt at a kind of tri uh, ethical triangulation. Um, and here I'll probably come to a stop, but I, um, would point you all to, I wanted to talk about Metasama's work, um, but I am going to be respectful of everyone's time. <laughs> um, but this is just a little introduction into sort of how I'm thinking about sites and the ethics that are tied to them and poetry's form in response to them. So thank you everyone for listening. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little abrupt. <laughs> um, yeah. And so it is now a great pleasure for me to introduce Kelly Crumry. Kelly Crumry is a PhD candidate and Fairfield Fellow in Creative Writing at the University of Denver. Her critical and creative writing can be found in Tarpaulin Sky, Diagram, La Vague, Black Order Review, and elsewhere. She serves as a prose editor for Denver Quarterly and a contributing editor for, oh, Emily and Kelly are both contributing editors for Annulet. Journal of Poetics. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you. Uh, I didn't catch all the names of the people that you talked about, Alicia, so maybe when I'm talking, you could put some of them in the chat. I was, I was scrambling because um, I was especially interested in um, mining, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, coincidentally, repetition for Emily and mining for Alicia. Uh, considering that we're all on the same panel, that's good. 
I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, and then play from start. Okay, cool. So I'm going to talk a little bit about measurement. <clears throat> I've been hung up on measurement, as in the description of this panel, wondering what constitutes a site or a dimension or even a direction, how we know the extent of a line, whether in geometry or in language. I drafted a manuscript of prose poems titled No Measure. That's an attempt to get at this very pickle. It's about repetition, grass, perception, a desert, desire, and weather. When you measure, you take a thing and compare something about it to something else. This, this something else is usually something known, a standard, even a rule, a ruler, for example. You're always measuring against something else. This against is finding a way to make countable something that is not countable. Further, measuring is a process that allows the observer to discover a property that is already actual, i.e. already existing, regardless of its measurement. This means if I have an apple, when I measure around it, I discover its circumference using a standardized tool that makes countable a property of this apple. I'm going to take us on a course of measuring that will end with a couple of poems from No Measure, but I'm going to slide into it, the paper kind of going in one direction. I'm curious about what we might mean by new sites of negation and vacuum as these exist in poetry, which we might call a measure of something, language a measure of an image or experience. This led me to revisit Jay Wright's book length poem, The Presentable Art of Reading Absence, just because of the title. But on this read, I was struck by how often Wright appeals to measurement. For example, the poem is 72 pages long and lines on each page range from about one to nine words and forms of the word measure appear 13 times, which seems like a lot. And there are recurrences of similar words like forms of calculation, rule, scale, and count. This instant becomes the smallest unit of meaning in the universe. Someone must go forward with the proper measure. The poem is about or is a process of meditation, both the body and mind's presences and absences measuring against what? Counting breaths, the body's seated position, movements in the space of the mind. This morning, I covet a troubled necessity. I step up and step down a scalar plethora of mind and find myself distended, undefined. And at once the measure of this radiant moment structures a deceptive absence. The poem begins and ends with the same 15 line stanza, exactly repeated, but for one lack of indentation. These stanzas begin with the word here, which might be the best possible word for measuring something absent as it is tied to and defined by the time and place of its utterance, its absolute immediacy, but without a link to context means nothing or anything. Its reappearance at the end of the poem creates a kind of fold. A line pulls one side to the other. Elsewhere, can I be forgiven for going beyond the evidence of my return to here, a place from which I have never set out? A third of the way through, I came upon this sentence about the image of one's own face mirrored in its incarnation or in another. No image sustains, nothing speaks of unfolding. As I read it, my eyes skipped the semicolon, no image sustains nothing, then looped back and found it, wrestled with the triple negation in no, nothing, unfolding, nothing speaks of unfolding. 
Something speaks of folding. My mind's measure sought alignment. I was reaching for something. A little while later, the poem takes the form of a dialogue. Our desire is a map of failure. Come here now, let's arrange ourselves. Nothing speaks of unfolding because desire is a map of failure. Another here, here, accompanied by come and now, three deictic words centered on a site. Is that a presence or absence? But it's the word arrange that found the measure I was looking for. The echoes of here and no image unfolding reminded me of stanza six from part three of Gertrude Stein's Stanzas in Meditation, another long poem, another meditation. It is not a range of a mountain of average of a range of an average mountain, nor may they of which of which of a range to have been not which they which may add a mountain to this upper and add it, then maintain, that if they were busy to speak, add it to, and it not only why they could not add ask, or when, just when, more each other, there is no each other as they like, they add why then emerge and add in, it is of absolutely no importance how often they add it. This stanza is a multi-dimensional site of measurement phrases folding in on each other like sedimentary strata. And I won't be able to show all I see in it, and there's likely much I don't yet. But one of my favorite things about it is that it's riddled with its. It begins and ends with it, a pronoun in many places here without referent, as in the initial it, which simply launches the sentence, an act of syntax and little else. But the map of failure here, no image sustains, is through its use of range. A mountain range, of course, but also a mathematical range, a term for the limits of a set of numbers that can be used to form an average. These are typically arranged in order from smallest to largest. If you add a number to the range, it creates a new average, unless that number is zero. A range and an average are a measure. The range of these words spans from it to it. A measure of a mountain, how many there are, summit elevations. For a long time, I wondered about the phrase and add it, though it's not unusual for Stein to put an article in front of a word we wouldn't expect. But as I was looking over the stanza this week, after rereading right, I remembered that I know that word, add it. And add it is an entrance to a mine, or even a hole in the ground to probe for minerals, to see where a mine could be dug. They're all over Colorado. And add it is a taking away for a potential threshold a site to pull something out of. What's added to affect the average of the range is a removal. This is tied up with desire to what we want to get out of the mountain or get out of the measurement of it or get from the poem, what's important, tracing any of these lines. What am I looking at in Stein's landscape? Is her measure or range double or not calculable? I often think of a sentence I heard from Ed Roberson from a talk he gave a few years ago on science and poetry. He said, the eye sees in only one line. But when I went back to my notes to find it, I found that I didn't write it down. My notes said, see handout. When I found the handout, I saw that the sentence wasn't on it. But the handout was a transcription of Roberson's talk, part of which read, I see myself as looking for what there is to be seen, the accuracy of what we see, and observing seeing as an accuracy, if it is. 
Science to me has always seemed to test accuracy, what really is there. If we look at poetry, even from its earliest forms, it is the observed detail of one thing to inform us about another. No measure. <clears throat> An expanse. There is ground here, sand and grass. You drew the map before I came here, strung up the wires, plowed the rows, completed forms, framed the landscape. The desert, we name its distance. An instrument is scored for my measure. That is, it tells me what to look for. Its notches name a distance, its units an account. I have an array of these, wooden and metal rulers, a wound tape, a clicking wheel, a hanging scale and string and pencils. I hold a tool up to something still. To measure is to align, to measure against. The string is slack against the grass. The string does nothing. I do. I spread the legs of the compass, draw a circle in the sand. One thing makes its mark in another. What measure is in the grass before I define it or before you tell me what to look for? I look up at the window. We know what glass is. We send sand out and it comes back like this. I send myself out. I walk through the field and come back as what? Yours? If my reach catches, the horizon recedes or moves back as I walk toward it. At what point am I along the grass blade? The end, root, some ridge, its emission? I mean, my location on average is relative. My skinny arm disappears when I twist it. Wires glint along the grass blades, tall grasses, thin as wire, green and yellowed, brown and white, a mass tangled and dry at the bases, in and out of sand. The grasses along the wire, tall, thin grasses, mostly still, mostly upright, then bending over, then broken, then green and dewy, then letting off seed, then emerging between the rows at the edge of the field, then only in record, then on the screen, then plotted, then averaged, their mean growth, their mean intake, their mean grip on the sand, their mean hold on my eyes, their total mass, their variable release, their explicit form, their inching, their width ceasing, their trace on my knees. I want to discover a property that is already actual, but actual only here. What measures me? A set of eyes? Scale collapses to weather my inquiry. I know my reach is impossible. I know it. That's the end, thank you. <clears throat> So I guess we can open it up if anyone has any comments or questions. I have a couple I could ask if necessary. Okay, I'll ask one. Emily, I have a question for you about your work with repetition with regards to performance. And I'm wondering if you can say a little bit about um, the difference between observation of a performance as it's acted versus reading a performance text, um, especially with regards to considering that I can reread 
the text even within, you know, like moments of, of reading it in initial time? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think there's a couple different schools of thought about whether a text is a performance um, that I think a lot of performance scholars would say no, um, because one component of performance is that it's time-based and site-based. And even if you repeat it every night, it's going to be different. Um, whereas a text, you can reread it. Um, and so I'm, I'm, but I'm interested in this idea of thinking of things like a text as performance. Um, so even if maybe it's not, it is not performance, it could still be read as performance, if that makes sense. Um, and like what that does to something like an autobiography, for instance, um, and you know, what it means to try to write down and make create a text that is re a, a revisitable um, of something that when you're living it is perhaps not quite as fixed as the text might claim that it is. And so I think of repetition as a way to call attention to that kind of ambiguity that just looking at a polished text might not necessarily always be able to, to show. Um, I have a question for you, Kelly. Um, I know you're interested in day access but as it came up in your talk. And I was thinking about um, line as pulling that you mentioned, like as pulling through a fold. And I was wondering if that's something you think that didactic language does, if it like pulls in a certain direction or how you think about diaxis in terms of measurement. Yeah, I, I think about it all the time in, in literature and writing, because I, I think my favorite words are and when I encounter them in poetry or in fiction, in fiction especially, are, are like now and here. Um, and in that line from Jay Wright, the come here now, that's that's a command, right? That, that one that one's person is speaking to another um, to pull that person into, into their location. Um, so yeah, I think they do act in that kind of way. And in fiction, it can be really interesting with regard to um, the tense of a piece. Like Virginia Woolf is a really good example um, where she often will write in the past tense, but use words like now frequently. So things, so like time is a little bit distorted in like the, the act of reading or the moment of occurrence, um, even though like it's like syntactically completed. And I find those tensions particularly exciting and interesting uh, to noodle on. Um, but I think the answer is yes. I, I do think of those words as a, as a kind of pulling or a pushing, like go is one as well, right? Um, because they are tied to the utterance, they're tied to the speaker, even, even in reading. Um, so there's gotta be, there's some kind of gesture happening with them regardless of, of where they show up, I think. Lindsay, would you like to ask a question? Let me unmute. Um, am I unmuted? Okay, I'm gonna leave my video off because it's snowing and I'm, I've been out in the snow. But um, <laughs> I thank you all. Um, I loved hearing you talk about your work and um, and and the, all the places in them. I guess I have my question is that that um, one term that I feel like all of you are kind of skirting is just description. Um, and I was struck by, even in like the description for the panel, you're talking about mapping and scoring and representation as ways of accessing sites. And so I wonder what your, this goes for any of you, what your relationship is to description, whether these, whether there's something about the term description that seems wrong to you, um, whether you'd prefer to think about it in other ways. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious about that about about um, about that word and, and what it means to you, especially in relationship to these site uh, po site poetics. That's a good question. And you're <laughs> and you're right. And um, I guess I'll just say stuff because yeah, to give. Yes, please do. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's a moment when I was 
putting together my talk where I, I landed on the threshold between depiction and description. And there's something um, about, and I ultimately chose depiction because I wanted to opt for something that felt more material um, for whatever reason, even though like we're talking about like the distinction between like script and picked, right? Um, so uh, there's also something about like, I'm also just skittish around um, the rhetoric of a narrative position with regard to the outside world at all. And it kind of, when I, when I tend to think about what description, how description might operate in a poem, there's something that like confirms, like you thereby must confirm like the position of like one per, even though this is already kind of inherent to the situation of a poem anyway, you have to confirm the like position of one witnessing person. It's also, I think I'm becoming allergic a little bit to the notion of witness, even though I've spent a lot of time thinking about it myself, I wonder about how we can get outside and around thinking about like just the viewer, about that kind of viewership or like maybe if we're just focused in on one thing, maybe we're missing other things by mm -hmm. nature of that rhetoric too. So I think I opt, for, I opt for depict because I think that there's something about like communicating the surround which is more aligned with how I'm, what keeps me interested in poetry as material. Uh, if that makes sense. I, I can just say quickly that um, with regards to my like my dissertation research um, and other work has, you know, been around math and science and, and literature and those relationships. And I think de description is is essential in considering those two fields um, as they attempt to describe the world around us, like even even like a mathematical model, especially as it relates to like a scientific experiment, um, is a picture of what of what somebody sees. And so um, Max Planck um, wrote about it in the concept of causality in physics, which I have it up on one of those slides that he he talked about um, science as being a translation, where something that you observe in the world, you translate into the language of science or mathematics. Um, for whatever purpose, you know, like you're trying to learn about it or, or make change. And he called that the world picture. And then you take that world picture or one might and translate it back into the real world in the form of action. Um, like you might conduct another experiment or you might try to remedy the issue of this, you know, nuclear waste site that Alicia pointed out in her poems. And so I've been thinking about the differences and similarities of like poetry and creative work and art in general um, that engage with these kind of scientific ideas and language and how they describe or don't describe or refuse to describe in, in some instances. Emily, do you want to talk? Yeah, I'll just add to that quickly. I think for me, like back when I was first learning like the basics of creative writing, description was given to me as like a novelistic tool. Um, for some reason, like description applied to prose and like, you know, image applied to poetry. And so it's not something I like, I think about um, in a lot of detail, even though like you could argue that they're exactly the same thing. Um, and so for me, because I'm interested in like the way sites change over time, um, I want, I try to like move away from something that might um, like feel overly static. Um, so if like I'm giving, even if I'm giving a description of a space, I wanna think about it as something dynamic rather than something that remains the same. I'm not sure what our time uh, limit is, but Cree asked in the chat if I can clarify about in the Stein example I gave, if add it was something she intended uh, the reader to discover or peculiar to my personal reading. I would probably say the latter. Um, it is a mountain, so it makes sense. It's not like totally random to come to the conclusion of add it, but she puns, you know, words a lot of times where she'll break a word apart and spell it a little bit differently and, and the sound that you hear um, reading kind of quickly or something might um, bring a different word into light. And I've seen that happen enough often in her work that I feel comfortable assuming that that she put at it at it there. But it is kind of a, a weird word, um, a particular knowledge. 
So yes and no. <laughs> Anything else? So I think we have time for one or two more questions, uh, if there are any or... Uh... A hand raised loss. Loss, you got your hand up. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Uh huh. Okay. Uh, oh, I just, uh, so I am interested that so much. I mean, obviously the development of the ideas and the talks and using a specific literary example is um, really elegant, um, um, which I appreciate the, the exploration of these ideas, but I can't help but be struck by the idea of here and now, and that kind of those kinds of concepts immediately of immediacy um, when, and in, in a sense, you know, being in Zoom or whatever this is, that um, uh, if it's its real name, that um, we're like not here anymore in a certain way. Indeed, in fact, people were saying um, that they couldn't be in New Orleans last year, but it's nice to be here now where we're not um, here now although we are in a certain bigger sense. So I'm just wondering if, you know, given the specificity of that, those concepts which I love and especially in Gertrude Stein and some of that sort of very immediate, tangible, you know, mountain language, material of mountain language, you know, if any panelists have given thoughts to that, because I feel also with that, the angle of history, we've kind of crossed, you know, through this, um, this the past year, we've also crossed another kind of historic threshold. So I, I'd be interested if people had given that any thought, especially as they prepared for this this uh, iteration of the talk, and uh, which you know came off extremely well. But it's just sort of here, but not here, if you know. I can briefly try to attend to a little bit of that. I did not, I, you know, I just, I, I, a personal disclosure is that I conduct like the major relationship of my life for the past six years, like over Zoom. So I am very accustomed to, or like over Skype. So like, I am very accustomed to like living, you know, with a partner, quote unquote, long distance. So I don't even, it's like second nature in a certain sense. Although it's not, the feeling of being in public is totally different, even though it's something I do all day. Um, but in terms of the talk or, and how I think about preparation and something or like in, in terms of how I've prepared or like um, how it relates to poetics, um, something that has interested me, especially if when I if and when I begin focusing on poetry that's like so located, like is like rooted in place, attends to specific, you know, points in time and location and historical events that, you know, we believe happened there, you know, we can't actually see that they were there because we're not there, um, is that I, I tend to think of it like as a kind of like commemorative or like something I kind of want to get at is like, how does everybody participate in like the commemoration, right? Like we're all then that knowledge is like begetted and located in like a little system or a little site history of a text and that in itself produces a kind of knowledge that also like syncs up with different like similar sites of violence or similar sites of you know event um, you know that create a kind of network of knowledge production that create a kind of pattern. Um, so that's something that I I think about. I don't really I'm not, I don't really have much of a conclusion that way yet in of that yet. But. Thank you for allowing me my little personal disclosure, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, for me, um, it's something that is starting to come up in, in this project in particular in my work. Um, you know, I'm interested in engaging with um, 
sites that have been important to me in the past. Um, but right now, the best way to do that is to like get somebody to Zoom the space to me rather than travel. Um, and so um, I don't really know what that's going to develop into, but it's been like an interesting way to think about how to do site specific work in the midst of a pandemic, definitely. Anybody else? Yeah, I want to. I want to thank um, our three panelists. I, I'm sorry, Lisa. Were you going to say something? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you so much for this. This was truly uh, amazing and uh, fascinating, and I was I was totally into it. Um, and um, so, so thanks to Emily and Kelly and, and Alicia. Um, and uh, hope to see you all here tomorrow afternoon at three. There's a workshop, and then we have another round table uh, in the evening. I think it's at six or maybe seven. Um, but uh, Please join us for the for the rest of the fest, and uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you for having us, and thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, thanks so much for all your questions and comments. Thank you all so much, and for being here.